absolutely senseless and horrific acts of violence. And all Nick Lemieux had to do was walk away. All he had to do was walk away. That's what you've seen in this case. You saw he told Lieutenant Hart, they told me I can't run away. Obviously not true. Think about the result of his actions. Everything you've seen in this trial, the horrific injuries, the death of Isaac, why didn't he just walk away? His only explanation when testifying was, I stood my ground. I stood my ground. First of all, Wisconsin is not a stand your ground state. Objection. Overruled. I'll talk about that specifically from your jury instructions. Second, that's not true as I'll show you. He didn't just stand his ground. I'm not going to defend the actions of the boys who testified. It was cruel what they were calling Nikolai. They shouldn't have been mocking him, calling him predator, raper. But their conduct did not justify what Nikolai did. You heard from Alina, Isaac's mother, about her son Isaac. He was 17 years old when he was killed. He enjoyed golfing, spending time with friends. He recently started a new business detailing cars. He was an honor student looking forward to going to college. His death was senseless. One of the things defense said in the beginning of trial in their opening was they're glad there's a video. So are we. Without the video, Nikolai would have slipped away. The only reason he was apprehended was because law enforcement had that screenshot of him. The video doesn't fade with time, it's not biased, not influenced by alcohol. As I told you in the beginning of this case, the violent episode from the video is about 25 seconds, from the point he punches Madison until you see him walking off after stabbing five people. He's not seen, Nikolai is not seen in that video for eight to nine seconds until the point you see him walking away. You don't see him stab Dante. Some of you may have wondered why we called Larian Davis. Certainly it wasn't for his eyewitness testimony. But he took a video. He took a video that captured a different angle than Juwan's video. It's grainy, it's difficult to see, but you can see enough. <clears throat> and it shows Nikolai seeking Dante out and stabbing him when his group is in the opposite direction. Nikolai walks into a crowd of people, stab down, stabs Dante. Before I show you that video again, I need to provide some context from Juwan's video. Take it off. Please. So here at two minutes and six seconds, this is after Nikolai has stabbed the four people that you do see, parts of on the video. He's standing next to Ariel. Ariel's there. Nikolai's not by himself. Two minutes, eight seconds, that's the last you'll see of Nikolai until you see him walking off in this video. You see Dante, or AJ, the boys running back to their tubes, and you see Larian filming in the background. Larian captured what, what Nikolai was doing at this point, even though this video didn't. And here, in a moment, you can see the edge of Dante swim trunks on the right. You can see the light on top, the dark on bottom. At this point in 
Larian's video, Dante's just been stabbed. And next you see of Nikolai, he's walking off. You can see Dante in the background, holding his stomach, looking down at his wound. Well, actually, you can keep it up for a second, sorry. And then for con um, further context, you see Alex Bang running to Isaac. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see Larian's video. <clears throat> Nikolai admitted he walked up to Larian, I mean, excuse me, he walked up to Dante and stabbed him. He admitted Dante was the last person he stabbed. Here you can see Nikolai, dark swim trunks, bigger build. On the right, you can see Dante, swim trunks, lighter on top, darker on bottom. You'll see Nikolai walk up to Dante and stab him in the chest. You'll see Dante recoil from the stab. You see the boys on the right running to their tubes. And in the second here, you'll see Alex Bang. You'll zoom in on him as he runs to Isaac. I'm going to show that again. So few things to note, there's, no, there's nothing between Nikolai and Larian. He's not surrounded. His friend Ariel is there at this point. There's nothing to the left and behind Nikolai, except his group in the distance that you can't see on video. He walks away from those directions towards a group of people and stabs Dante in the chest, not standing his ground. He's seeking out Dante. That's retribution, not self-defense. And recall to the DNA results, Isaac's DNA and Dante's DNA was the only DNA on the knife. They're also the last two that are stabbed. It makes sense from how the analyst described DNA and how it can wash off. You probably noticed throughout this trial, not a lot of witnesses come off with them great after they testify. There's some exceptions. Obviously, the Good Samaritans who went to aid Isaac and AJ. Eric Von Williams included in that from Nikolai's group. He's the only one who went to their aid. Sheena Lowell, you heard her testify from the Carlson group. You saw her just standing in the background watching what was going on the whole time. She was completely sober. You heard her testify, Nikolai Punch Madison. She has zero connection with the group anymore, zero contact. Her and Quentin broke up. Tony is another one. He only comes in to break up what he thinks is a fist fight. He's directing. Nikolai, towards Nikolai's group, Nikolai turns and stabs him twice. Another one I submit to is an exception that acted admirably is Isaac. His death was tragic and horrific. This is what you see of Isaac in the video. On the left, he's standing next to his tube, not moving away from his tube. He's pointing at Nikolai to leave. In the middle, when Nikolai turns back to Isaac, Isaac puts his hands up, fingers played. The only other thing you see of Isaac is him standing in the background. When the boys, other boys are mocking calling names to Nikolai. Isaac is just standing in the background. He's not saying anything. He's not doing anything. He's not jeering. He's just standing there holding their tubes. There's been a 
pretty serious mischaracterization of Isaac's actions with regard to when he gets stabbed. Defense has tried to clarify it, classify it as a strangulation. Defense accused the state in openings of being selective in the photos we used, the frames, to try to show a certain narrative about Nikolai smiling. As you've seen, he's smiling a lot in the video. But defense is actually doing that with when it comes to Isaac. Nikolai never said anything about being choked, never said anything about pain on his neck, even when specifically asked by the start nurse, never mentions anything. And the video doesn't lie. So on the left, Nikolai has just stabbed Riley, who you heard from multiple witnesses who are just standing there. Tony comes to try to break it up. Nikolai stabs him twice. Isaac, just off frame, I submit to you, he just saw Nikolai stab those two people completely unprovoked. Although he was in the background the whole time, not doing anything, he came, he came to their aid. And he pushes Nikolai. You can clearly see it's a push. He has one hand on the arm, other hand on the chest. It's Nikolai's own action of thrusting the knife into Isaac's heart that moves Isaac's hands. You can even see from the release, it's a push. He's not sitting there left holding his hands out in a choking motion. Can we take the screen down? Yes. I'm going to show you the video. So you can see it's obviously a push. While my computer is loading here, even if it was a strangulation, which it clearly isn't, Isaac was justified in using any level of force. He just saw Nikolai stab two people who posed no threat to Nikolai. Tony was breaking up the fight. He had actually ignored <laughs> Nikolai at first, walked past him, pushed Dante out of the way. Riley was just standing there. Met two minutes and three seconds. Can we have the screen? Clearly a push. Defense has mischaracterized the entire situation as 13 on 1, 13 on 1, implying it's some sort of mob beating up Nikolai. It's not even 13 people yelling at Nikolai. As you saw in the video, Gabby, Janelle, they're just standing in the background. Isaac, he's just standing in the background, not yelling anything. It's 13 people in the proximity, only two close to him, two tiny females. Nikolai's clearly not afraid of the boys. He ran up on the boys, turns his back on them and others multiple times. Even at worst, this is a two-on-one with AJ and Dante. But even then, as you saw in the video, Ariel's right there. So it's more like a two-on-two, -two. Ariel's right there. Plus, Tony comes in as a neutral party to separate things. It's not 13-on-one. As soon as AJ gets disemboweled, you see people start to move away. So it's not, there's not even 13 people immediately around. You saw Owen way in the background because he saw the knife. So why try to mischaracterize the situation? Because there's some things that are hard to explain otherwise for defense. Can you turn on the screen, please? This is the second time you saw in the video that Nikolai turns his back on the boys and people from the Carlson group. You don't turn your back on somebody. It's common sense. You don't check your common sense at the door when you serve as a jury. You don't turn your back on somebody if you're afraid of them. 
especially if you're so afraid you got to reach for your knife. You can't be that afraid that he's got to reach for his knife and so unafraid that he turns his back on them. He was angry, not afraid. That image on the right is only less than 30 seconds after he turns his back on them, touching his knife. The defense tried to explain that change from in that 30 second window by saying he was getting pushed by Madison and Riley. He was getting pushed. They're lightly touching his arms and they're tiny. They're not in his face. You can see in the images, they're standing close. They're not in his face. They're not shaking their fists at him. They're not even sticking their fingers in his face. They're standing close to him, touching his shoulders, pointing, yelling at him to leave. <clears throat> I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about Nikolai looking for the fall. So Eric Von Williams from Nikolai's group, you heard testify, before any of this happened, he was concerned about Nikolai's behavior. He was concerned that people were going to think he was a predator. Ernesto told Nikolai not to go look for the phone. The group, others in the group told him not to. You heard they didn't care about the phone. Ariel didn't care about the phone. Nikolai went. Sandy said he went twice, was back for five to ten minutes, then went again over by the boys. Defense argued in opening that the, the boys' goal, their goal was to humiliate Nikolai. Clearly, he wasn't looking for little girls. But the boys were not completely unreasonable in their belief. Eric Von Williams thought the same thing. They reacted wrong. But they just didn't invent this whole thing in order to humiliate Nikolai. What about Nikolai, 52 years old, apparently sober, according to, I think, what defense will argue. Uh, he didn't have any signs of intoxication when law enforcement made contact with him. But he certainly made a point of telling Lieutenant Hart multiple times how much he was losing and drinking on the river. He can't let it go that he was insulted. So much so that as the boys are tubing away from him, all Nikolai has to do is stand there. He doesn't even have to take a step back. He just has to stand there, let the boys continue tubing. They're down in their tubes. He starts walking up to them, touches his knife, and then runs up to them. You heard Nikolai's ridiculous description or explanation for why he ran up on the boys. Because one was holding a phone. He thought it was Ariel's phone. You also heard Nikolai had to concede, had to admit, that pretty much everyone on the river had those phone cases. Another double standard from defense is physical attributes of those involved. They wanted to elicit evidence that Nikolai is feeble. Sandy, he wasn't feeble according to Sandy. He had a surgery a couple years ago, recovered in a few weeks. Maybe things took him a little long, longer than they did before. He wasn't feeble, according to Ernesto. You heard Ernesto, when he was being asked about the stabbing, said, he's a big guy, he was in the army, he doesn't need a knife to defend himself. He didn't say, oh, he's this fragile old guy. He's clearly not feeble, as you see in the video. He runs up on these boys in the water. He leaves behind devastating, devastating injuries. Slices clean through two of Isaac's ribs. He comes out of the whole event essentially uninjured. While defense tries to argue that Nikolai is this feeble old man, they ignore that the only two people actually standing close to Nikolai are these two females that are barely over 100 pounds. If the boys are a threat, why does Nikolai run up on them? And clearly he knows they're not a threat to him. When he ran up on them, grabbed their tubes, standing over them, they did nothing. They didn't kick up at him, they didn't punch at him, they jumped out of the tubes and moved away from him. He knows they're not a threat to him. 
They're mocking, saying cruel things, but not violent. You saw how awkward it was for Nikolai to try to explain this transition. From zero fear to 10 out of 10 fear, he's got to take out his knife. Try to explain it with what I submit to you is obviously rehearsed testimony about his scales of fear. You heard from witnesses recounting what they recall of Nikolai, the demonic look on his face, looking, staring through people, smirking. Defense argued in opening, it's a slide tour here, there. You know after seeing the video so many times that's not the case. When he's not glaring, he's smirking in the video. Recall I asked Ernesto, his best friend, when he was trying to describe the shock of Nikolai, I asked, was he smiling? He didn't say, yeah, he smiles when he's scared. He smiles when he's nervous. He said, who's going to smile in a situation where they're in shock or in fear? Nikolai was angry. He wasn't afraid. He's smirking even as he's holding the knife. Why didn't he just walk away? The fence had tried to argue there's rocks unstable, his sandals were bad, didn't stop him from running up to the boys as they're tooting away from him. Why didn't he just hold the knife up? Say, hey, I got a knife, back up. You saw, Owen is the only person who saw the knife and you saw his reaction. So everyone else is moving forward and respond to Nikolai punching Madison, Owen's trying to pull people back. Next you see him, he's off in the distance. This whole thing would have ended if Nikolai just held up the knife. Instead of opening it down by his waist without looking down, because it's human nature, if he would have looked down, people would have looked down. He holds it down by his waist, opens it up, never displays it, or says he has a knife. Nikolai did not act as any reasonable person would in that situation if they were truly in fear of their life or great bodily harm. So let's talk. Here's, here's Owen reacting, as you see. Again, Isaac just standing in the background in the middle. You see when other people are moving forward, Owen's trying to pull them back. You heard him yell, bro, he's got a knife. So let's talk about the punch to Madison. I submit to you the evidence shows clearly, beyond a reasonable doubt, Nikolai punched her. She fell backwards, but caught herself. Multiple witnesses testified to seeing her falling backwards. Defense is saying, arguing or on cross. Well, she's not wet. She didn't actually fall down. If witnesses are all standing in that kind of semicircle around Nikolai, she gets punched and falls backwards, and then their attention's back to Nikolai because Dante's hitting him. They're not going to see that she caught herself. They're going to think she fell down. Look at her position next to Riley. They're shoulder to shoulder in front of Nikolai before the camera pans away. When the camera pans back, now Dante's shoulder to shoulder with Riley, and Maddie is back. She clearly got knocked backwards. Her sunglasses aren't on her head anymore. Defense has a double standard about that too. If there's not a photo of it, it didn't happen. There's not a photo of an injury, it didn't happen. We know Nikolai got punched, he didn't have any injury. The fence can't have it both ways. So I'll turn and talk a little bit about memory, credibility, Obviously, a witness's memory is better closer to the event. That's obvious. Alcohol is going to affect memory. Traumatic events can affect memory. How fast it happens is going to affect memory. But crucially, and absolutely crucially, there's a huge difference between getting some details wrong, right hand, left hand, sequence of events, and making up an entire story like Nikolai did. Defense has tried to highlight throughout the trial, Nikolai was in this traumatic experience, 
give him a break. It's understandable. He made up this huge, all these lies, told this whole story. Even though he looks calm and collected in the videos, he's convincing in the videos, talking to the sheriff, talking to Lieutenant Hart. But don't give any sort of credence to the theory that trauma affects memory for the, anyone in the Carlson's group, any of the boys, any who were stabbed, any who had to drag Isaac as he's bleeding to death to the shore, AJ who was disemboweled. Don't give any credence that trauma might affect their memory and how accurately they can remember all the details. But Nikolai, who invented an entire story, tried to skip through the crowd Give him credence for that. You saw what happened to all these witnesses, how fast it happened. It's not surprising some of the details are wrong. But the major point is, is accurate, is consistent. This all started when Nikolai punched Madison, whether it was the right hand or left hand. You heard the turmoil of the boys when they realize Isaac is stabbed. Clearly a traumatic experience. There's a big difference between details and invention. Think about the most basic example. You and say your partner go to the grocery store. Park your car, you're leaving the grocery store, you think your car is parked over there, they think it's parked over here. You still know the car is parked in the parking lot, even if you can't remember where it's parked. The same is true for the punch to Madison. You heard from 10 people, from both from the Carlson group and the boys group, that Nikolai struck Madison. So what about, let's talk a little bit about witnesses from Nikolai's group, Ariel, what did he say? At trial he says, Nick defended himself, can't really say how, <laughs> never said that when interviewed with law enforcement, he denied even being close to Nikolai. Remember, Ariel was there when he stabbed Dante. He was right there when Nikolai stabbed Riley, Tony, and Isaac. Law enforcement went there with the frame of Ariel standing next to Nikolai when Nikolai has the bloody knife. Ariel denies seeing anything to law enforcement of what Nikolai did. Ernesto, at trial, testified he didn't see Nikolai get hit, just saw him down in the water. Said he couldn't remember Nikolai saying, they took my knife. You saw on the body cam, he said that repeatedly. He testified that somebody was walking towards him, he pointed at him, get back. Never said that to law enforcement, although he did describe to law enforcement, as you saw, him saying, Nikolai, get out, Nikolai walking out, and then he said, and that's it. Never said anything about anyone pointing at him and walking towards him. When I asked, he said, I wasn't asked that question, but he described that event. He also wasn't asked more than 10 times if Nikolai said they took my knife. So, about the punch to Madison again. Sergio, he's in Nikolai's group. He had walked out a little ways. You can see him in the photo on the left, in the top right. He had the white shirt, white bucket hat. He testified, he saw the blonde girl in the black leotard walk over to Nikolai and say, go, go, go. He said it repeatedly to law enforcement. And he said, Nikolai pushed her. So this is what it would have looked like from his perspective, although a lot farther back in that photo on the right. How could he have seen Nikolai do anything to Madison unless she got pushed back, punched back, something violent, not some light push. He's not gonna see that from where he was. Madison testified, and you saw in the video, after she was hit, she goes back to her group. Why would she walk away back to her group if Nikolai just lightly maybe touched her, maybe didn't? She told Quentin she was punched. 
She told police at the scene she was punched. She told police in the interview she was punched. She testified about feeling the throbbing pain in her cheek, her heartbeat in her cheek. Maddie testified, she was told by law enforcement, sheriff's office, they didn't need the photo. You heard about that misunderstanding. She was, had anxiety about deleting the photo. In an effort to console her, she was told, don't worry about it. This is an important jury instruction in your jury instructions. Although we're not a stand your ground state, there's also not a duty to retreat. But in determining whether Nikolai's actions, whether his use of force was reasonable to prevent or terminate the interference, you may consider whether he had the opportunity to retreat with safety, whether such retreat was feasible, and whether he knew of the opportunity. He turned his back on them multiple times facing open water. People were yelling at him to leave, to walk away, to go. And he didn't. Instead, he took out his knife. That is not reasonable. You heard from Sheena Lowell, Janelle Duxbury, Gazi Kazri and Nazimpour, Dante Carlson and AJ about the strike to Madison. You heard from the boys, Ryan Nelson, Joan Cockfield, Landon Wire, and Alex Bang. Alex Bang originally described him as a slap. You heard from Owen that he heard an impact and saw Madison fall back and catch herself. Defense has to argue that they're all either lying or mistaken. All these witnesses, including Sergio. If they're lying, why wouldn't Quint why would Quentin say I saw some some swelling and some slight redness, but didn't see the punch. Why wouldn't he just say, yeah, I saw the punch, too? Why wouldn't Tony say he saw the punch? Why wouldn't Tony say he saw Riley get stabbed and she's just standing there? They're, they tried to explain what happened as best they could remember. The punch isn't on video, but you see the reaction. You hear Dante yell, you can't hit a woman before Riley is stabbed. They obviously didn't plan this lie in the chaos of the moment. So the only thing defense can argue is they're mistaken. That all these people standing around Nikolai in that half circle, proximate shape, they're all looking in that direction, including Sergio, including Sheena, who was by the group, the, the tubes for the Carlson group. They all were wrong in what they saw. Another defense double standard. It's relatively minor, but I submit to you it shows that they're grasping at straws. Is this trying to put Nikolai's group in a different category. There's the drunks on the Apple River, then there's Nikolai's group. About half of you raised your hand that you've been on the Apple River. That's what people do on the Apple River. They go up, they tube, and they drink. Nikolai was in the exact same boat they were in. He, he wasn't bird watching and this group of drunk teenagers ran up on him. He knew what it's about. He'd been on the river before. Another thing about the punch to Madison, you heard that they didn't get to see the video before giving their statements. Even Jawan, who took the video, said he got, his, he got far enough to get the screenshot of Nikolai, and then law enforcement took his phone. He didn't get to see the video. You saw what happens in this case if somebody lies about something that happened on video, because Nikolai got burned by that. He made up complete and total lies. Video showed he wasn't telling the truth. The video happens to not show the punch, but it still corroborates what all those witnesses said. So count six is battery to Madison Cohen. It has four elements. Nikolai caused the battery to Maddie, or caused the injury, the harm, the pain. She testified to that. He intended to cause the harm despite his denial. I submit to you that's clear. You don't punch somebody without intending to cause harm. She didn't consent. She testified to that. 
He knew she didn't consent. She's a stranger. Obviously, she didn't consent. He knew that. Punching Madison was not self-defense. Again, there's no duty to retreat, but you have to consider the opportunity to retreat, the knowledge of the opportunity to retreat, and whether the use of force was necessary in preventing the unlawful or the interference in Mr. In Nikolai's um, person. So what is the interference at the time he punches Madison? The boys are saying cruel things to him. Maddie and Riley are standing in, in front of him, lightly touching his shoulders. People are pointing and laughing, the boys. They're not, Maddie and Riley aren't in his face. They're standing close, but they're not in his face. What amount of force was necessary to prevent that interference? People yelling at him, Maddie and Riley standing close. What amount of force was necessary? Absolutely zero. Just walk away. That's what people are yelling at him to do, just walk away. Instead, he takes out his knife and punches Madison. Regardless of whether you, you were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt it was a punch, Nikolai essentially admit, admitted to pushing her. Your Sergio said it was a push, although when asked, he couldn't remember if it was a push or a punch. There's still provocation. Your jury instructions talk about provocation. And how that affects self-defense. Person may not use or threaten force intended or likely to cause death unless he or she reasonably believes he or she has exhausted every other reasonable means to escape or otherwise avoid death or great bodily harm. Remember, Nikolai ran up on these boys who are too boy. They didn't run up on him. He ran up on them as they're tubing away from him because they insulted him. He was angry. He didn't walk away from the boys to leave the situation. He went over to Maddie, who was yelling at him to leave, and he lies to her and says, they took my snorkel. I'm going to play that for you so you can hear it. Right, this is at 105 in the video, I'm ready. Go! 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 and accused the boys of taking a snorkel, which was a lie. And he had just ran up on the boys. So, after he runs up on the boys as they're tubing away, he goes and tells Maddie they took my snorkel. He's standing there, smirking at people, takes out his knife, either punches or pushes Maddie. That's provocation. Defense has zero reasonable argument, especially when it comes to Tony, Riley, Isaac, and Dante. Nikolai gets punched, he gets struck with an open hand twice. He gets ineffectually pushed by AJ. It doesn't do anything. Nikolai pops right up and disembowels AJ. After Nikolai goes down in the water, nobody approaches him. Nobody. Nobody goes to kick him. Nobody goes to punch him. Nobody goes to push him again. Tony, with Nikolai down on the ground, Tony walks by Nikolai with his back to Nikolai, yelling, get back to Dante. He turns around to tell Nikolai to get away and Nikolai turns around and stabs him. Nikolai was facing his group with an open path of escape after provoking a reaction. He just stabbed Riley before stabbing Tony. After stabbing those two, he stabs Isaac. 
after that, after Ariel's there, he walks over to Dante, stabs Dante in the chest, right below his ribs, right below his heart. So self-defense. I submit to you the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt this was not justified self-defense, and Nikolai knew it. He knew it from the moment he did it. First of all, imminent threat of death or great bodily harm. He's not in an alley with no way out, with people blocking his exit. He's on an open river, 150 feet wide, people yelling at him to get away. None of them are armed. Punch, two open hand strikes, ineffectual push. Look at, your def look at the definition of great bodily harm, whether he reasonably believes death or great bodily harm is imminent. <coughs> for attempted first degree homicide for Dante, AJ, Tony, and Riley, the state has to prove that he intended to kill each of them. And the acts demonstrate unequivocally, under all circumstances, that he had formed the intent and would have caused the death of each of them, except for the intervention of some other person and an extraneous factor. Third, the defendant not actually believe that the force used was necessary to prevent death, imminent death or great bodily harm. So for the intent to kill, but for outside circumstances. AJ is beyond clear. He would have died, but for the blood in the helicopter. He would have died, but not for the surgery Dr. Meyer performed. He is lucky, extremely lucky to be alive. What, what else was Nikolai's intent but to kill when he slices him up like that? He had the knife blade up. That wasn't an accident. He did not know. He, the first thing he does with it is slice up AJ's stomach. Riley, he slashes across the ribs. You saw the horrific nature of those wounds. He cut into her stomach, cut into her diaphragm. Luckily, he didn't hit any major arteries or her heart or lung. Tony blocked one stab, so Nikolai stabbed him again. The one he blocked, you saw in the injury, was very close to where AJ's uh, artery was severed. Dante was stabbed again, just below his heart. But for Nikolai missing vital organs, but for medical intervention, Mew claimed he had tunnel vision. Oh, sorry, I'm back up. So Dr. Meyer also testified you heard about any time there's a puncture, stab, puncture wound to the torso and stomach, they have to go in because there's so many major veins, arteries, organs, they have to go in to make sure something major isn't done. Nikolai killed Isaac, almost killed AJ. Riley needed emergency surgery, luckily, but for dumb luck, he missed the vital organs of Dante. But for AJ blocking one strike and missing vital organs, he survived. Nikolai said he had tunnel vision. Come here, screen. I thought everyone close to me was attacking me. I thought anyone touched me was attacking me. He didn't stab Ariel, and Ariel came up. It makes the tunnel vision claim a little bit unconvincing. For first degree intentional homicide of Isaac Schumann, Nikolai stabbed him so hard he cut clean through two ribs. The wound was deeper than it was wide. He sliced Isaac's heart. There's no other intent when you stab somebody directly in the heart than to kill. An intent to kill doesn't need to be planned ahead of time. Your jury instructions talk about that. It doesn't have to be formed a week, a month, a day, even a minute in advance. As long as he had that intent when he does the act, that's intentional homicide. The first element is he caused Isaac's death. That's obvious. Acted with intent to kill. I've addressed that. Do not actually believe the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. I'm going to get to that in a little bit for all the counts. Third element, he did not reasonably believe the force was necessary. That also goes to, I'm oh, sorry, that's part of the third element. 
So how do we know, how do you know, how can, what Nikolai believe? What a reasonable person would believe? That there's only one person on the planet who experienced what Nikolai experienced, saw what he saw, was standing in his place. And what did Nikolai believe? He believed it was unjustified. The very first thing he does is walk away, doesn't run, doesn't tell Ariel or Nesto anything, doesn't tell them to run. He walks away from his group to the other side of the river, at some point rinses the knife because it wasn't covered in blood, <laughs> throws the knife onto the bank before walking back to his group, says nothing to his group other than they took my knife, puts on his hat, sunglasses, and shirt, and sits down in his tube. He's the one, as he said in his interview, who says, let's go, let's get out of here. They can't right away because Eric isn't there. You saw, and as they're tooting down the river, you saw the video of him casually paddling along. You saw, so plan one, get away. Slink away with the crowd. That didn't work. Plan two, play down. Can you take the screen down, please? Camera recording started. Still doing all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's going temperature? on? Temperature? Temperature's okay in here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Somebody, right. I hear somebody got stabbed. Um, and I fit the description. Yes, you do. All right. Yep. So we're working what? through that now. Okay. Did you see that fight on the river? I heard about it. You heard about it? Yeah, and I've seen people gather around it. Okay. All right. And I went over to talk to see if somebody saw anything, but that's about it. Okay. Our whole group was pretty interested in finding out what happened. Okay. And that's your whole group over there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't know. Okay, well. Did you see anybody injured? No. You didn't see anybody injured? No. Did you see anybody fighting? I, I heard people screaming at each other, yes. Okay. Yeah. Screaming in anger or screaming in pain, do you know? Everybody's drunk, so I don't know. I can't tell the difference, but I would say... I don't know. Just screaming. Okay. You know, you know, calling each other names. But, you know, that's, I've seen that all day. And we've all been drinking a lot. I'm sure they're drunk. I'm sure they're doing... I don't know. Okay. Kids right. being kids. Kids being kids. Where where are you? Where's your group from? Where did you drive from today? Sure, they're drunk. Kids being kids. That's what he told Sheriff Coons, and he's acting like he has no idea what's going on. Clearly not in shock. Let me take it down. Sorry. <clears throat> Clearly not in shock. Clearly Nikolai knows that it's not justified and he's looking out for Nikolai. Slinking away didn't work. Plain dumb didn't work. He's told he's under arrest for homicide. Plan three. Completely lie about what happened as to justify him using lethal force. The boys pulled out the knives. They twisted their arm, poked him. That's what he used, poke, with, his own, with their own knife. So first degree intentional homicide and second degree intentional homicide are very similar. The, for first degree, this did, act, did Nikolai actually believe, did he actually believe that he was not justified? For second degree, it's the reasonable person standard. I submit to you, it doesn't make a difference in this case. It's crystal clear. He knew he wasn't justified. He knew he wasn't justified. It's crystal clear from his actions after the fact. Can't be explained away by shock. He's clearly not in shock. The use of force on AJ, stabbing Riley just standing there, stabbing Tony trying to break it up, stabbing Isaac directly in the heart. 
Ariel's there, walking up to Dante and stabbing him. The injuries he left behind, that all shows his intent. Again, you have to consider whether he knew he could retreat, whether there was a safe escape. He could have just walked away. He could have just raised his knife. He didn't do any of that. He just stood there with the knife until he punched Madison. He touched his knife when running up on the before running up on the boys. He takes out the knife, opens the blade up, never says anything, never walks away, never takes a step back, never raises the knife, never yells for help. He's smirking with the knife in his hand. Originally, I mean, finally, after stabbing five people, then he walks away. Doesn't run, walks. It's shocking to see what Nikolai did in this case, to see the injuries, and then see his calm, cool demeanor after the fact, tubing down the river, sitting in his tube at the scene with chaos, casually talking to Sheriff Knudsen, making up this huge lie to Lieutenant Hart. He even lied to the start nurse at 9 p.m., so five hours after the incident, about the boy pulling a knife, twisting his arm, poking him with his own knife. He even lied to Sandy after the arrest. Nick recognizes that his, what happened, is not justified self-defense. Just standing there with the knife, not walking away when he clearly can. So even to Sandy, after he's charged, he casts blame on her and the group for not hearing him yelling, for not hearing him yelling. He never yelled. Normally, it'd be difficult to know what a defendant believed in a self-defense case, not in this case. Nikolai was not in fear. He snapped. He was angry, and he snapped, and he knew it. His actions show he knew he did not reasonably believe the amount of force was necessary. He was not actually in fear. If he was actually in fear, he would have left. How else do you know what other clues? Think about his testimony. We submit to you that this is first degree intentional homicide and first degree attempted homicide. His acts clearly show intent. But if you can't agree unanimously on that, as your jury instructions tell you, you have to consider second degree. Again, the difference in second degree is Nikolai's belief versus reasonable person. Here you know, I submit to you, his belief from his own conduct. Afterwards, he knew it was not justified. If you can't agree on second degree, you consider first degree reckless homicide, first degree reckless in danger of safety. Element one, Nikolai endangered the safety of another human being. That's obvious. Endangered the safety of another by criminally reckless conduct. The jury instructions def define criminally reckless conduct, creating a risk of death or great bodily harm. It's unreasonable and substantial. He was aware of the risk. Again, obvious when he's stabbing people. When you talk about reckless conduct, let's say you believe his testimony that he just thought anyone touching him, anyone close to him was attacking him and he was stabbing him. That's reckless. That's criminally reckless conduct. That's utter disregard for human life. What other clues are there out of this regard? He just walks away. He just walks away. He doesn't call 911. He just sits on his tube as other people are helping the victims. And he tubes down the river. The last. Your jury instructions talk about the last, the question, the special question, yes or no, did he commit these crimes while possessing a dangerous weapon, the pocket knife? There's nothing inherently wrong with carrying a pocket knife. A lot of people carry pocket knives. <coughs> totally fine to carry it as a tool. Totally fine to carry it in, for self-defense. Totally fine to carry any legal weapon, firearm, knife, if it's used legally. Nikolai did not 
he was he was not justified in self-defense when he attacked these people. So we ask that you answer yes on that question. In the end, what is beyond clear, Nikolai knew he knew this was not self-defense. All of his actions, from the minute the stabbings are done, from the second the stabbings are done, he knew it. It's obvious. His actions were horrific. They were senseless. He killed Isaac Schumann, stabbed him directly in the heart, disemboweled AJ, stabbed Tony who's trying to break up a fight, Riley who's just standing there, and then walks up to Dante. <coughs> that walking up to Dante, stabbing him when he's got clear paths to retreat, that destroys any argument that this was self-defense. He was angry. There's no <coughs> rational reason Nikolai, his groups over here, would walk this way towards the group of people to stab Dante. Senseless and horrific acts. The state asks that you find Nikolai, you guilty of all charges. Thank you.